organized crime tore through the suburbs of Chicago, leaving violence and corruption in its way. Prominent officials were seduced by greed and power, doing whatever was necessary to protect their interests. Everyone was on the take. It would fall on the FBI to weed out the corruption and to find the killer of an innocent woman. Willow Springs, Illinois seemed like any other quiet Midwestern community, but it was really one of the most corrupt places in the nation. This tiny village nestled just outside of Chicago was in the hip pocket of organized crime. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It was only a matter of time before corruption led to assassination and conspiracy. To end it required a federal sting operation of astounding complexity. The bank of a sanitary canal in a remote industrial area became the site of a gruesome crime. The killers were quick and thorough. Nearby, two police officers were out on night patrol. When they heard the shots fired, they became alarmed. One of the officers drove towards the canal to investigate. He found nothing as he searched the desolate area. Hey, Chief. Also on the scene was Willow Springs, Illinois Police Chief Michael Cook. I heard it earlier myself, and I've already checked the area, so it's he too saw nothing. I got a cup. Do you like it? The following day, a prominent local attorney called police to report that his wife was missing. Well, Mr. Masters, we'd like to ask a few questions about your wife. Lieutenant well, Howard Vanner of anyway, the Cook can. County Sheriff's Department and his partner Probably responded to the Thank call. You. Attorney Alan Masters said that his wife Diane had been out the night before with colleagues and friends from a local college where she worked. She never came home. There was no sign of her yellow cat. He said he made calls trying to locate her until two in the morning, but finally gave up. For the officers, the information offered little insight. Excuse me a minute. Lieutenant James Keating of the Cook County Sheriff's Department joined the office. Yeah, fine. Yes, you can sit down. Sir, we were just asking Mr. Masters questions about his wife's disappearance. He asked Masters, Masters if he could have a look around the house. Be happy to. Sure. Yeah, fine. Masters fine. agreed. No, not at all. He had nothing to hide. The officers continued their questioning. Anything else you can tell us? As far as I, as far Reluctantly, as I know, Masters uh, offered some new information. Some somebody, somebody works for the college. He suspected that his wife Diane had been having an affair. Maybe the two lovers had run off together. I don't know who he is or what he looks like. I just have my suspicions. Excuse me, guys. I think we need to wrap this up. Lieutenant Vanek wanted to investigate further and look around the house himself. Sir, I think we need to take another look around in here. Husbands are always suspects when their wives I disappear. Look around. There's nothing, nothing. Sir, here. we need to look around. It's time to Something's go. Missing her, Let's sir. go now. But Lieutenant Keating intervened. He sir, wouldn't allow it. Two investigators always check out the scene. In his mind, everything had checked out. Now. Let's sir. go now. Vanek was upset. He didn't know why Keating would undermine his investigation. Outside, Keating confronted Lieutenant Vanek, telling him to back off. 
As far as he was concerned, Masters was not a suspect. But Vanek didn't buy it, and he let Keating know. Just as the two men were about to explode, Willow Springs Police Chief Michael Corbett arrived at the scene. Let's eat! Come on, guys. Both be on the same side. Come on, man. Keating would have the final word. Hey, Vanek, you're off the case. Forget it. You're off the case, man. You got that? The question still remained, where was Diane Masters? Her disappearance grabbed the media's attention. And Diane, if you would, please come to She had been very active in the local community. Diane had worked hard to help open a shelter for battered women. She was also involved in local politics and sat on the board of the Moraine Valley Community also College. Like to Diane with his plaque. She did not appear to have any enemies. All the hard work and her dedication in opening this crisis center, something that is needed desperately in this community. But investigators began uncovering other details. It was reported by Diane's friends that her husband was controlling and abusive, and that Diane was planning to file for divorce. Assistant U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza followed the case. We were pretty certain that what had happened here was that Diane and Alan in a regular, had a regular marital dispute, sort of ordinary dispute, but that it had escalated uh, into something much worse. Go ahead and send them in. Scorza's investigation soon revealed that Alan Masters was more than just a bad husband. Hey, Alan, how you doing? It was rumored that Alan Masters had bribed local officials and police officers to secure favorable outcomes for his clients. How'd it go? Very well, very well. Nothing to worry this about This corruption at all. extended no right to the top of law enforcement. Allegedly, Masters frequently enlisted the help of Chief Corbett. I don't hear about this anymore. It'll be worth every penny. Right. It was also rumored that Masters and Chief Corbett were involved in safeguarding some of the Chicago mob's betting and prostitution rings, which were run out of show clubs throughout suburban Cook County. But investigators were focused only on Diane's disappearance. With no evidence and few leads, that investigation stalled. Unaware of Alan Masters or his wife's disappearance, the FBI had already begun an independent investigation into the mob-controlled rackets of the Chicago area. U.S. Attorney David Stetler worked with the FBI to help unravel the prostitution operation. At that time, there were a number of topless, bottomless joints that one could go to, and many of them were undercover fronts for prostitution. So you could go in, uh, you could watch the naked girls dancing on the stage, and for a price, you could retreat to the back, either to a booth or a back room, and engage in one form of sexual activity or another with the dancers. The club owners knew that their customers would spend more on drinks and prostitutes if they could use their credit cards. But the patrons were reluctant. They did not want bills arriving at their homes or businesses with charges incurred from nightclubs with CD names. The club owners found credit card transaction companies that were willing to process the charges using false but respectable business names. Special Agent Ivan Harris of the FBI's Chicago field office was assigned to help bring down the illegal businesses. The scam uh, was using various companies in order to launder credit cards uh, through their business to make it appear that uh, businessmen were actually uh, eating at a restaurant or using a limousine service uh, to incur the charges when in fact uh, they were charges for prostitution. Larry Wright was one of the credit card transaction company owners. Wright would pick up the week's transactions from the clubs and process them through his company, National Credit Service, or NCS. 
One of his clients was a club owner named Joseph Marin, whose club was a front for a mob-controlled prostitution house. Wright wanted to expand his own operations. He approached Marin about setting up an illegal betting club. Marin was willing to help out the man who made him money. Wright would first need to pay protection money to local police in order not to be exposed and arrested. Marin was the man who could arrange that protection. Wright was more than willing to pay. Marin arranged the meeting at the Willow Springs Police Department. It was to take place with Police Chief Michael Corbett. It was believed that Corbett had been handpicked by the Chicago mob boss to oversee and protect their interests in and around Willow Springs. The word on the street, of course, was that no one could do anything in Willow Springs without the permission of uh, the chief of police, Mike Corbett. The message also was from virtually anyone you would talk to that he was so powerful, that he was so well connected, that nothing could ever be done about him. I just want to make sure I don't get any unexpected visits. Corbett agreed to help Larry Wright set up the new betting operation a for a price. Not quite yet. In return, yeah, Corbett assured him he wouldn't get any heat from his officers. Going, all right. Larry Wright was well on his way. He returned to his office at National Credit Service, operated out of a nondescript office park location. Wright worked with two other staff members. Doing great, Larry. Great. But these were not ordinary employees. NCS was not just a credit card transaction service for illegal activities. It was a front for the FBI. Larry Wright was actually undercover special agent Larry Damron. And he and the FBI were using NCS to work their way into the heart of the corruption in Willow Springs. While local investigators struggled to unravel the disappearance of a prominent attorney's wife, the FBI had set up an undercover operation in the town of Willow Springs, just outside of Chicago. Their target, organized crime and the corrupt police who protected them from prosecution. The undercover work was often painstaking and frustrating. FBI Special Agent Larry Damron explains the difficulties inherent in undercover work. During the course of the undercover operation, you try to immerse yourself in what you're doing and you, and you try to assume that role because it's necessary for you to do that in order to uh, accomplish anything. Oftentimes you'll hear people make comments or you'll see people do things that uh, in any other circumstance they would be arrested for immediately. And so what you have to remember is you're in a role and you play that role out. Dameron had heard stories about how the mob resolved problems. They were swift and violent, and their signature was unmistakable. Two bullets in the head. There was no room for mistakes. Victor Spilatro, a player in Chicago's organized crime, approached Damron at NCS. I shall Though Victor himself like wielded bandit. little power, okay, his brothers held tremendous okay. influence within the mob's hierarchy. Damron was starting to move into the center of the violent Chicago underworld. The Spilatros were one of the best known names uh, of mobsters in Chicago. Uh, the uh, older brother, uh, Tony, was the boss in Las Vegas. He represented the Chicago outfit uh, for their interest in Las Vegas. Um, had been a prominent figure and had been uh, widely uh, uh, mentioned in the papers, having been involved in murders and extortions and things like that. 
Agent Damron quickly developed a reputation as an effective businessman in laundering money for mob operations. Sure, everything's all right. Spilatro knew of NCS's activities with the local nightclubs. They were under his control. Really appreciate what you're doing. Good, everything's going good with the business? Yes, it's going great. Well, that's great. Good. He told Damron he would have to pay him a cut to stay in business. I'm glad you appreciate what we do for you. Okay, well, that's really good. Damron had no objection. The level that we had there is we were paying protection to a fairly important uh, aspect of the mob, the Spilatro family. And so that gave us a little bit of uh, uh, status, if you will. But we had absolutely no authority or anything like that in the mob. We were just workers, and our value was we made them money. Agent Damron traveled to a remote hotel where he met with FBI Special Agent Gordon Brooks, hey, who oversaw the undercover operation. To ensure that Damron's real identity was not compromised, the two met infrequently to exchange information. Brooks vigilantly kept tabs on Damron. The investigation was as dangerous as it was complex. The agent cautiously moved forward. He wanted to continue expanding the FBI's undercover operations. He used every opportunity he could to sell the idea of opening more betting and prostitution houses throughout suburban Chicago. Even with a go-ahead from the Spilatros, Damron would still need permission and protection from the police. He met with nightclub owner Joseph Merrick hash out the details of the new clubs and secure police protection. But there was a problem. Look, look, I got some upsetting news. What's up? Their protector, Chief Corbett, had been removed by the Willow Springs City Council under suspicion of corruption. Marin knew another high-ranking law enforcement official who could provide the same protection as Corbett. Lieutenant James Keating, Cook County's Vice Squad Supervisor. I'll tell you what, you know, he deals with me. U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza was not surprised by the development. Keating's reputation was well known. Okay, you feel, you feel pretty confident about this guy. Jim Keating was a, a lieutenant in the uh, Cook County Sheriff's Police Department, but if anything, the rank understated his influence. He was a very well connected uh, officer in a very corrupt department. Uh, he had connections with people of higher rank who were also corrupt, and so he was a key figure. With Corbett out of the picture, the FBI shifted their focus to Keating. Hey, I really appreciate Damron met with him at a restaurant outside of Willow Springs. It allows me to really concentrate on my job. Keating said he'd have no problem helping Damron expand his operations. One thing we need to understand is if there's a situation that comes up... But uh, any move Damron decision, made would have to be approved by him. I make the decision when something goes down. He warned Damron to play it straight with him and his people. He told us that the one thing that he wouldn't tolerate was if someone double-crossed him. And he said if, uh, if that happened, that we'd, they'd find us with our legs on one of the streets in the area and our head on another street in the area. As instructed by the FBI, Damron proposed another operation, a club that would be a front for prostitution. Short, gonna hold on to this one. He gave the lieutenant the first of many payments to ensure police protection. Yeah, looks like a bonus for the guys. Huh? Mm -hmm. Before he left, Keating said he knew someone who might be able to help him, a lawyer named Alan Masters. Hold on to this one. And I really Though he had no direct dealings with Alan Masters, Damron had heard the name mentioned by Chief Corbett. Well, I knew that Masters was a well-known attorney on the uh, south side of uh, Chicago, that he had a tremendous reputation for being able to uh, get things done, particularly in the, in the local court system. And the, uh, uh, the scuttlebutt was that, that he wasn't reluctant to pay bribes or to deal with people however he needed to. Damron continued his meetings Sorry. with his case supervisor, Special Agent Gordon Brooks. Alan Masters. Damron needed to know everything he could about Alan Masters and his relationship with Keating and Corbett. Now, you're in with Corbett. He's 
dirty. The FBI and U.S. attorneys quickly established a hierarchy within this ring of corruption. Okay, you're making your way up to Keating? All right. Corbett was the king in Willow Springs, but any time he had to do something that involved the broader Cook County, he needed to get the permission of Keating. And Keating always had to check with the ultimate fixer, Alan Masters, to make sure everything could be handled at the court level. As the extent of Alan Masters' criminal activity became clearer, the FBI began looking closer at his possible role in his wife's disappearance. The two distinct cases were beginning to overlap, and Damron's objectives were broadening. Authorities come three counties. He was a suspect in the disappearance of his wife. Uh, it was thought that if we could develop a relationship with him, there might be something there uh, that would come come to light and uh, and might be of some benefit to that investigation. Damron learned that Alan Masters allegedly made payoffs to several area judges in exchange for favorable decisions. Now, we need to have that hearing on the Sanderson case. It needs to go our way. Do we have an understanding on that, Judge? Agents speculated that Diane might have witnessed her husband's illegal activity and threatened to expose him. I think we can come to terms with that. Right this way, sir. Now trying to elicit information about Diane's disappearance, Damron continued his efforts to make inroads into the corruption around Willow Springs. He met with Keating several weeks later to follow up on his plan to open a show club. Again, Keating mentioned that his friend Alan Masters could help. Damron took the opportunity to bring up Alan's wife. Keating said little but then added an unusual comment. We talked uh, about Master's wife uh, turning up missing, and Keating said, well, she turned up missing like the day before the divorce was going to be filed. That was convenient, wasn't it? It was convenient. And chuckled about what a, what a good circumstance that was. Damron was cautious not to probe too far, fearing that Keating might grow suspicious. You've known this fellow for a long time? Yeah, known he, him for a while. He, I've worked he, with them before. Sure, he can do. Just As the that. meeting ended, Keating handed over Alan Masters' phone number, saying the lawyer was enough. expecting uh, his you call. Won't be okay, I just need to make lined up. I'm going with the same. He proceeded to set up the meeting with Alan Masters. Hello, Mr. Masters. How are you? This is Larry Wright speaking. The attorney agreed to help push through all the necessary permits and legal documents, which meant bribing officials and securing protection. Yeah, we've been working uh, pretty hard on it for a while now. Well, soon I think it'd be Masters a pretty good suggested they get together. Talking about, uh, the meeting was set for the following week, December. Monday, December 13th. Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to meeting you then. Uh, I think we can maybe do some business. Okay, thanks. Bye. Before the meeting would take place, however, a police officer on routine patrol near the Sanitary Canal area in Willow Springs noticed something unusual. Tire tracks led directly into the canal. He immediately called for assistance. Little did he know that the lid was about to come off the underworld in Willow Springs. Find these trucks out here, Mark. While the FBI continued their undercover operation in the Chicago suburb of Willow Springs, an officer out on routine patrol made an alarming discovery. Tire tracks leading directly into the sanitary canal. Police officers and a dive team responded to the site. Overseeing the investigation was James Ross, an honest cop appointed by city council to replace Michael Corbett as the police chief in Willow Springs. Though Corbett had been ousted from the department, his legacy of corruption remained. Below the surface, divers found a virtual underwater parking lot. 82 cars lined the bottom of the polluted canal. U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza believed he knew why the cars were there and who could make a profit by allowing them to be dumped without a police investigation. 
those are known as uh, insurance give-ups. Uh, people who want to collect money on their car when the car is not worth very much anymore will find a way of uh, losing the car and then reporting it stolen and collect the insurance. Uh, my belief was that Corbett had been uh, the approver of all of the dumping of the cars in the Willow Springs Canal. By nighttime, a third car had been dredged up, a yellow Cadillac. The license plate on the vehicle DGM-19 was well known in Willow Springs. It was the tag registered to Diane Masters. Lieutenant Keaton of the Cook County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene. Chief Ross was surprised that Keating, a vice cop, had been notified. He asked Keating why he was there. Keating had no response. Officers continued examining the Cadillac. When they pried open the trunk, they discovered a decomposed body. Ross immediately ordered that the car and the body be taken back to a city garage where they could be thoroughly examined for clues. The decision not to use the police garage was well-reasoned. Chief Ross knew this case potentially had far-reaching implications, and he couldn't trust his own officers. The fewer people nosing around, the better. State police began to scour the car and the body for evidence. They found 22 caliber shell casings in the trunk. The keys were still in the ignition. Eerily, the watch on the deceased body and the dashboard clock had stopped at exactly the same time, 1.50. They removed the body for further forensic investigation. The forensic team examining the body found the skull had been crushed. They also discovered two bullet hole entries in the left cheekbone. The bullet fragments inside the skull were removed and sent off to the FBI lab for ballistic evaluation. Dental records confirmed what everyone believed. The body found in the trunk was Diane Masters. The nine-month investigation into Diane's disappearance was now a homicide investigation. Come on in. Chief Ross called in Cook County Detective John Reed to work the homicide. He was to team up with the FBI, who was now taking over the murder investigation. Detective Reed was not to trust even his closest friends in the department. He was told that through the FBI undercover operation run out of NCS, law enforcement officers were being investigated for corruption. And some had ties to Alan Masters, who was now a firm suspect in Diane's murder. As Agent Harris and Detective Reed initiated their murder investigation, Agent Dameron continued his undercover operation. He called Alan Masters to confirm their meeting to set up the show club. I expect to be in court all day tomorrow. I'm sorry. Masters was evasive and seemed distracted. That's okay with you. Maybe we can maybe we can work something out then. Just give me some time. He canceled the meeting. Okay, thanks. Damron immediately called Keating. With the conversation being Keating. recorded by the FBI, the he hoped now. Keating would explain why Masters was being evasive. No, I was wondering if you had any information on that. As I said, he's uh, pretty busy. Uh, how about if you give me a call in three or four weeks? But Keating was cryptic. Maybe we can work something out then. He instructed Damron not to bother Masters. He had too many problems to deal with. Okay, bye. 
the new show club would have to wait. What do you got for me? Damron met with Agent Brooks. Masters and Keating both appeared nervous since Diane's body had been discovered. But that was hardly enough evidence to prosecute either of them for murder. Perhaps Damron had overlooked something. He handed over his tape-recorded conversations with Keating. This is gonna nail him. We're gonna get him. Can you play that again, please? Mm -hmm. Over the next several months, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Cook County Sheriff's Department, and the FBI began the process of merging the various investigations. All right. Well. The link between them was Alan We're Masters, to this tape. Cook County Lieutenant James Keating, and former Willow really Springs Police Chief Diane Michael Masters Corbett. Murder. If that's the case, if we can put, if we can it would fall on prosecutors to begin constructing a case proving that the three men and all of their activities represented an ongoing organized criminal enterprise. And what we had to do in order to prosecute Masters and Corbett and Keating for a collection of their activities, including the homicide, we had to show that they made up a criminal organization, a mini mafia. Appreciate you meeting with us tonight, Mrs. Capstaff. Um, well, if you guys Detective Reed and Agent Harris's first step was to question Diane's friends who had been with her on the night she disappeared. Okay. You said that you uh, followed her home that night. One of Diane's colleagues, Genevieve Capstaff, had actually followed Diane home that evening after a board meeting. And so I just wanted to see, so I followed her. Capstaff claimed everyone on the Moraine Community College Board who worked with Diane suspected that she was having an affair with an economics professor. She admitted that she wanted to see if the two were going to rendezvous. She followed Diane to her street. When Diane turned to go home, Capstaff continued on. Is there anything else that you can tell Further me questioning revealed that all of the community college board members, the including Diane, were given a $100,000 life insurance policy as part of their employment benefits. The policy specifically stated that proceeds would be paid if a board member died while traveling to and from board meetings. The policy was void when the board member entered their home. Alan Masters claimed Diane never arrived home that night. He was therefore eligible to collect the insurance money. Several months before Diane's body was discovered in the trunk of her car, Masters filed a claim with the insurance company. After filling out all the paperwork, he sent it off. Though Diane's fate at that time was unclear, Masters had a judge declare her legally dead. As a result, he was about to receive $100,000. Alan Masters was fast becoming the FBI's prime suspect in the murder of his wife, Diane. Shortly after her body was discovered, investigators learned that he had filed a claim with his wife's insurance company. Within a few months, two checks appeared in the amount of $50,000 each. If federal agents and prosecutors could prove Masters was responsible for his wife's death and that he profited from it, it would be one more element that showed that he and his accomplices were involved in an ongoing criminal enterprise. Homicide in a federal racketeering case carries much more jail time than a state charge. As the investigation began to take on a clearer focus, FBI agents working the undercover case received bad news. Listen, we're gonna have to move rather quickly on this. The Washington Post had gotten word of the operation. God, we're almost at the point where we can really make some we're impact. Down the, whole the Post operation. gave the FBI That's three weeks to wrap it up uh, before yes, running the story. Agents have to had no choice but to quickly bring their undercover to operations to a close. Here, so please, do me a favor. For U.S. Attorney David Hello? Stetler, the timing couldn't have been better.
the project had run its course and the bulk of the information anybody was ever going to get had been retrieved and to make the operation go on, go on longer would have resulted in additional evidence but it also would have resulted in the evidence that had been gathered becoming more and more stale. Agents had meticulously pieced together the web of corruption that extended to the nightclubs under mob control. Now it was time to shut them down. Go, FBI, open the door. Open the door. Go the FBI the hit all of the clubs on the same night with massive force. Several hundred officers and agents raided over a dozen clubs throughout Cook County, including those in Willow Springs. Stay right here. Go on in, folks. Stay right here. Get tight. Stay right here. Hands behind your back. Inside the clubs, federal agents were able to collect volumes of incriminating evidence. Fifty-five people were indicted, including club owner Joseph Marin, Tony Spilatro, and his brother Victor. They were prosecuted in both the state and federal courts for extortion, prostitution, bribery, and racketeering. Several deputies from the Cook County Sheriff's Department and officers from the Willow Springs Police Department were also indicted and convicted for protecting these businesses. After three years of undercover work, the sting operation was now officially closed. For undercover Special Agent Larry Damron, it was finally time to leave the role of Larry Wright. I would say the finish was elation and disappointment at the same time. Disappointment that uh, there were so many opportunities out there to, to identify other criminal activity. We knew that, uh, that it was a good job, that we had gathered tremendous amounts of evidence and that we had a, a real insight into uh, some of the criminal activity that was taking place that we hadn't had before. Alan Masters Local authorities, the FBI, and prosecutors could now focus exclusively on the Diane Masters murder investigation. They continued questioning her friends and associates, including the man with whom she was allegedly having an affair. Economics professor Jim Koselnia. He confirmed that he and Diane had a relationship. He also claimed that Masters had abused Diane physically, mentally, and emotionally. She lived in fear of her husband. Diane had told him she planned to file for divorce. Kuselniak also had reason to fear Alan Masters. One night, Kuselniak and Diane had met for drinks at a local bar. He recalled that Diane called home to check on her daughter. Instead of getting the babysitter on the phone, Alan unexpectedly answered. Alan? He suspected she was with her lover. Um, I didn't know you were He was involved. irate and began to threaten I was calling her. to check on Andra. He vowed to destroy her. Kuselniak said Diane returned from the phone call and was very upset. He went to the bar for more drinks. There, a man suddenly confronted him and began firing off a series of questions. Yes, I did. The man never identified himself. What's your name? He asked Kuselniak's name and where he worked. Kuselniak. Kuselniak. Though the man said little else, Kuselniak felt he had just received a threat. Stay away from Diane. And Kuselniak would later recognize the man as Lieutenant James Keating. 
He said that on the night of Diane's disappearance, she had called him and warned him not to meet her for drinks. So this was an unusual move on her part. They usually got together after her college board meetings. Lately, she had been troubled by Alan's behavior. Miselniak took her advice and canceled their plans. He never saw Diane again. Agent Harris and Detective Reed continued to develop witnesses. They discovered that Masters had hired a private investigator to keep tabs on Diane. We subsequently developed a cooperating individual named Ted Nakaza, who was a private investigator with uh, Alan Masters. Uh, Masters had requested Ted Nakaza to place a bug on his home telephone number because he suspected his wife, Diane, uh, was having an affair. I got a few tapes. Hey, what do you guys got for me? Nakaza told investigators the bug was successful in exposing Diane and Koselniak's affair. Ted Nakaza played back a telephone conversation captured on tape where Diane was talking in a highly sexual way with the boyfriend, Jim Koselniak. Um, according to Nikaza, after playing the tape, Alan Masters declared his intention to kill Diane and to get Keating to make it look like an accident. Alan Masters wanted his here. wife murdered, and he had the resources to get away with it. The FBI and local authorities continued to uncover evidence against Alan Masters and his associates that pointed towards a conspiracy to murder Alan's wife, Diane. Through a private investigator hired by Alan Masters, Diane's affair had been exposed. Alan's rage was out of control. But investigators had no hard evidence to charge him with murder. After an exhaustive five-year investigation, that was about to change. He intended to have Diane killed. They uncovered a Cook County Sheriff's deputy who was willing to talk. Agent Harris. Deputy Jack Bachman had startling information. Keating brought me into Bachman had been too afraid of the consequences of coming forward on his own. He claimed that he had been approached to kill Diane. The offer had come through Lieutenant James Keating. Bachman had a series of conversations with Keating, and ultimately Keating asked Bachman if Bachman would be interested in the job of actually stalking and killing Diane Masters. Bachman said Keating offered him $25,000 to carry out the hit. And Michael Corbett, the chief of police, had already agreed to dispose of the body. Bachman declined the offer. No, sir, I'm sorry. I can't get involved in anything like that. No, no sir. Through Keating, Masters had clearly oh, solicited a murder. I'll about this, this meeting we just had. And, uh, what well, no, but he did offer me This was one of the final pieces Prosecutor Scorza needed oh. to bring an indictment. He said he wanted to eliminate her. I said, what do you mean? What we were able to show is that when Alan Masters decided to kill his wife, he simply was able to turn to the two police officers that he'd already been working with on corrupt activities and criminal activities. And that made the homicide and the planning of it and the solicitation of it, it made it an activity of the criminal enterprise. The pieces had finally come together. Investigators put together a likely scenario of Diane Masters' murder. Alan Masters had found a hitman to kill Diane and her boyfriend when they met for the usual drinks after her college board meeting. However, Diane didn't meet with Koselniak that evening. We're home late tonight. The meeting ran late. Furious, Masters took matters into his own hands. Alan Masters was at home babysitting their young daughter. He was setting up his alibi by making long distance calls all night to prove that he was home. He never expected his wife to walk in the door. 
She did. She began the process of getting undressed, and he hit her with a uh, blunt instrument, two uh, blows to the head. Masters then called Chief Corp, who came with an unknown accomplice to dispose of the body. They dumped Diane's body in the trunk of her Cadillac. Corbett then drove away with the accomplice following him. Masters remained at home with his daughter. They drove to the remote sanitary canal. Diane's watch was reset to throw investigators off the trail should her body ever be found. They then fired two shots into her head. They wanted it to look like a mob hit. They also reset the dashboard clock to 1.50. Alan Masters made sure that he was on the phone for time to corroborate his alibi. Corbett and the accomplice dumped the Cadillac into the canal. In June of 1988, six years after Diane's murder, investigators brought charges against the three conspirators. Former police chief Michael Corbett was the first arrested on federal charges of racketeering, bribery, and conspiracy to solicit and cover up the murder of Diane Masters. Special Agent Ivan Harris tried to elicit a confession. Mike Corbett uh, subsequently confessed that he was, in fact, the person that had put uh, Diane Masters' car in the canal. Uh, he disavowed any knowledge that, knowing that she was in the trunk of the car at that time. Cook County Lieutenant James Keating was arrested next on the same federal charges. He, too, denied involvement in Diane's murder. And finally, Alan Masters. In addition to racketeering and bribery, the indictment against Alan Masters charged that he planned, solicited, and aided and abetted the murder of his wife. Prosecutors would not have enough hard evidence to charge any of the conspirators with the actual murder of Diane. Prosecutor Tom Scorza was able to successfully tie all of their criminal activities together for the jury. Masters was convicted on all counts. Collecting the $100,000 insurance money after having his wife murdered also made him guilty of mail fraud. He received a total of 40 years, effectively, to the end of his life. Former Chief Michael Corbett received 20 years. James Keating was convicted and sentenced to over 30 years. The Masters case was special in my experience because there was no one single piece of evidence proving guilt. What there were were a thousand little pieces that made a mosaic. That was made the case intriguing. It made it very difficult to present. It made it a challenge to present to the jury. But it made a terrific story because in the end, the jury could see how one little plate piece from over here and one little piece from over there made a picture. And the picture was a plot among three fellows who had been involved in a lot of criminal activity to do their ultimate criminal act, murder Diane Masters. Watch yourself. The undercover investigation that Agent Damron oversaw and the work of several other FBI agents exposed a deeply rooted corruption throughout Cook County and brought it to its ultimate demise. By weeding out these pockets of corruption, the people living in the suburbs of Chicago no longer have to live with the lawlessness that threatened to destroy the community.
So you got what I need? Okay. On the streets of New Orleans, All right. drug money bought the city's cops. Good. Officers became the strong arm of drug lords, brutalizing anyone who dared speak out. Jim! Jim! Help! With police tainted by greed, undercover agents would have to put their lives on the line to bring down the corrupt officers who hid behind a shattered shield. In a city of washing narcotics, the drug lords have all the power, even over the police. Corruption in New Orleans grew like cancer, eating away at public safety and threatening to destroy the city. Lured by easy wealth, crooked cops began breaking the laws they were sworn to uphold. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When it became clear that the police could no longer police themselves, the FBI had to get involved. It was a case where the line between friends and enemies became dangerously blurred. New Orleans, 1993. Tourists packed the city looking for a good time, not all of it legal. Cocaine was in demand and the dealers cashed in. It was a violent business. For protection, the drug lords turned to those whose duty was to serve and protect. The cops. Officers lined their pockets while enforcing the will of the dealers. They controlled turf like thugs, terrorizing innocent civilians. Agent Stan Haddon of the FBI's Public Corruption Unit in New Orleans was aware of the growing problem. Our intelligence told us that there was a great variety of corruption uh, taking place among uh, many different officers on the department. However, uh, this, the one thing that seemed to be the most pervasive was that officers were out there working with drug dealers on the street, were protecting drug dealers on the street, and were stealing money and drugs from drug dealers on the street. One such drug dealer was Terry Adams, known on the streets as Scabu. He was a small-time operator who was being extorted by Officer Sammy Williams. So you got what I need? Come on now, give me what I need. Come on, I but this know. time, the protection money Scabu paid Williams wasn't enough. On Christmas Eve, the officer demanded that Scabu pay him $10,000 cash by 6 p.m. If Scabu failed to show, Williams threatened to beat him and guaranteed him 20 years to life. That evening, at 5 p.m., Special Agent Stan Haddon was finishing up some last-minute work. About to go home, he took one last call. It was Scabu. His time was running out. He told Haddon that he was being blackmailed, but didn't have the $10,000 the corrupt cop was demanding in less than an hour. When Scabu contacted me, we realized that that was our best chance to do something about police corruption. And I immediately arranged to meet him and, and debrief him in person. Uh, there was no way we could get everything together by 6 o'clock. Um, by the time I met with him, it was uh, 30 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Um, Haddon and his partner quickly hashed out a plan. This is, I think, the best one we've got. Scabu would meet the officer as arranged, but he'd be wearing an FBI wire. The agents couldn't arrange $10,000 on such short notice. Scabu would have to convince the cop to accept smaller payments over several meetings. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, that could be rough. Well, you know that. You work with them. Yeah, I have. Assured by Haddon that he would be under constant surveillance, Scabu took his position.
officer Sammy Williams was still on duty when he arrived with a prisoner tucked in the back seat of his cruiser. drove Scabu to a deserted spot behind a seafood market. He ordered him to throw the $10,000 into the trunk. Scabu told Williams he only had $3,000 now, but would pay the rest later. If the cop arrested Scabu, he'd never get his pay. Agents hoped Williams would agree to meet him again for more of the money. He did, and the FBI had it all on tape. Hadn't believed this one incident would lay the groundwork for exposing more corruption in the New Orleans Police Department. Our main objective was to try and create a strategy that would enable us to prosecute as many bad officers as we possibly could. In the days that followed, Agents, along with prosecutors from the United States Attorney's Office, began to plan their operation, codenamed Shattered Shield. Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters would advise agents every step of the way on what would be needed to convict the dirty cops. We were involved really from day one. We met with the case agents on numerous occasions and discussed exactly what we were interested in being developed as far as evidence in, in the case. As with most corruption cases, the FBI's strongest evidence would likely come from wiretaps. According to Special Agent Karen Jenkins, an FBI wiretap specialist, securing them isn't easy. Title III is a court-authorized intercept or wiretap. It's very difficult to get one approved. It's a lengthy process, very time-consuming. Basically, we have to have approval by FBI officials to get one, and beyond that, we have to have the review and approval by Department of Justice officials. Finally, a federal judge will make the final determination as to whether or not one is authorized. After delivering two more payoffs to Officer Williams, Scabu had won his trust. Now the FBI seized the opportunity to take the operation to the next phase. Scabu would approach Williams with a proposition. The volume of drug business was going to increase, and Scabu would need more cops to protect it. If Williams was interested in higher payoffs, he would need to hire more dirty cops to handle the expansion. Williams took the bait. Scabu met with him for another recorded payoff in mid-January 1994. Don't forget now. But this time, Williams showed up with We're another officer. You, he turned out to be Len Davis, Sammy Williams' partner. Don't forget now, man. It wasn't surprising. Davis was known in the projects as a gangster with a badge. Reviewing the tapes hadn't discovered a problem. What are we looking for? Both Davis and Williams used the coded language of the drug trade. To make charges stick, the FBI had to record the officers using language that a jury would understand. Hadn't pressed Scabu to get Williams and Davis to use words like dope so there'd be no doubt at trial. But when Scabu told the cops, the dope is in, Davis suspected something was up. If you're, uh, if you're in the police business and somebody starts using words that are that overt and that plain, that immediately makes you suspicious that this uh, person is trying to set you up. Davis shoved Scabu into the car and told Williams to drive. The agents would be too conspicuous on the deserted streets. If they pursued the cops now, they would put Scabu's life at greater risk. 
the only thing they could do was sit patiently and listen to the wire. When the car came to a stop, Davis's rage ignited. He yelled that Scabu was never to say the word dope again. They immediately took him to a, a deserted location, aggressively searched him. Uh, you could hear the Velcro ripping loose on his clothes and stuff. And uh, that was a very tense moment. Davis insisted that he wouldn't go to jail for careless talk. He and Williams stripped Scabu looking for a wire. Scabu was sure he was going to die. Miraculously, they never found him. He's clean, he's clean, he's clean. He's clean. I'm not going to jail behind you. Their trust was restored. You understand me? Scabu continued his protection deal with Davis and Williams. For the next job, the cops drove him to a store where a drop-off was to take place. Inside, Scabu checked a bag at the counter. He passed the ticket to an agent posing as a buyer, who then retrieved the bag. Williams and Davis watched as each transaction went down. They were promised $1,000 for every kilo of cocaine they protected. For them, the deals meant easy money. Davis and Williams met Scabu behind stores and alleyways for the protection payoffs. The FBI recorded every word. Gradually, Operation Shattered Shield was building a solid case against police corruption. The recordings continued into the spring of 1994. Once agents were sure Davis and Williams were solidly on board, the FBI prepared to expand the investigation. With still more cocaine to guard, Williams and Davis would need to recruit more dirty cops. Federal agents hoped to snare every one of them. But agents knew the officers may become suspicious of Scabu's rapidly growing drug business. They needed to bring in a big time dealer, someone whose status as a kingpin would explain the larger shipments. You like some? Okay. Hadden called on Juan We're Jackson, down here is, uh, an FBI agent trained specifically JJ for working undercover. Represent a drug kingpin from, from up in the East Coast. At that time, I was in New York City, and I had been contacted uh, to come down to just uh, be interviewed and go over the actual case. A lot of times, they'll, they'll be looking for a certain person, height, weight, you know, color, or whatever, um, to infiltrate or get into a certain group. Known as JJ, the agent would act as Scabu's cocaine supplier, proposing to use New Orleans as a hub to store and distribute his product nationwide. I was a high-level drug dealer. Um, I played that role and I had ties where my operation uh, was in both Miami and in New York City. With the arrival of JJ, Shattered Shield was about to grow from a minor drug business to a booming enterprise. Jackson was one of the FBI's best undercover agents. He was smart and experienced. But his life would be in the hands of the informant, Scabu, who had no training. Jackson needed to build complete trust with Scabu, or they'd both be dead. The informant, because he lives that world, is probably the, for me anyway, the most important, because he himself has been there. He's been around these people. If he's not believable, it's not going to work. And I think uh, that was the big thing for me down there, was to make sure that uh, we were going to be believable. Jackson and Skebu rehearsed their roles again and again, preparing for the real test with Davis and Williams. Jackson, federal agent from the north, and Skebu, a southerner who had dealt drugs all his life, had to forge a common history. 
know you. Their story would be that they had met in the army. After their stint was up, they'd kept in touch. Right, okay. They hashed and rehashed details of their friendship, habits, fake memories that they'd have to know cold, and when to say them. They were dealing with criminals who could run thorough background checks and who were free to use deadly force. We knew that whatever we had, we had to keep it simple, but we had to make sure that we remembered certain things. The biggest thing I thought that helped us was my initials, my nickname. So no matter how many times they would ask him, what's his name? He believably said, because he only knew, <laughs> JJ. In April, the FBI was ready to introduce JJ into the operation. He arrived at a hotel carrying what was supposed to be a drug payment of $100,000. For the first time, Williams and Davis caught a glimpse of the big time dealer. Their perceptions would be critical. The first encounter was in the Sheridan Hotel. They were gonna stand at a distance and just observe. It was another test to see if they were willing to do what they were gonna do. Hey, I don't know how it's gonna work. They could arrest me right now and take me off and, you know, I'm down. You know, because it was supposed to be drug money. So uh, it was a test. Scabu told the cops about JJ and his plan to use New Orleans as a transport hub for his cocaine business. Davis and Williams carefully studied JJ's every move. Jackson was creating his character before their eyes. It would become his full-time identity, and it would have to hold up under scrutiny. Everything depended on what the cops thought they had seen, and if they believed the cash exchange was genuine. The plan worked. The cops were convinced that JJ was the real deal. The FBI was now poised to take Operation Shattered Shield to the next level. By the spring of 1994, the FBI's Operation Shattered Shield, targeting New Orleans police officers involved in the city's drug trade, was in place. Posing as a drug kingpin named JJ, undercover special agent Juan Jackson worked with Scabu, the drug dealer turned FBI informant. Scabu rented a hotel room for JJ to meet officers Len Davis and Sammy Williams for the first time. What's up, man? What's up? That was showtime. That was a big deal. On any first meeting with any bad guys, you know, a million things are going through your mind. I mean, are you going to be believable? Is anything going to happen that's going to change their attitude? It's either going to work from here or we're all going to go home. Playing the street-savvy drug dealer, J.J. insisted that everyone strip to establish trust. Sure. For this first meeting, Jackson didn't wear a wire. He didn't need to. The room had been thoroughly wired by the FBI for audio and video recording. Then, in a bold gamble, J.J. invited them to search the room. Because they were cops, Davis and Williams knew how to find a room wire. But J.J. bet his life on the FBI's technicians. The cops never found the wires. J.J. was beginning to build trust with the officers. But officers are trained to sniff out deception. I mean, you gotta think that I'm meeting with two police officers. Because of the guns, you also always have to remember the threat. You always have to be conscious of the threat and remember exactly where they are and what they're going to do and where the weapons are. With the cops convinced for the moment, J.J. began to discuss the proposal approved by case agent Stan Haddon. And he played the role of a big-time drug dealer from New York who was using New Orleans as a transshipment point, simply as a storage point, where he could bring dope in, leave it for a while, have it guarded and protected by the officers, and then thereafter have it shipped out to other points unknown. For their role, J.J. promised to pay them $5,000 every day the cops guarded the warehouse. 
real business, you know what I'm saying? Williams and Davis were enthusiastic about the plan, even offering advice. The cops urged J.J. to hire young drivers, give them company uniforms with name tags, and put signs on the sides of the trucks to resemble legitimate companies. For the FBI, the meeting was flawless. The meeting went off without a hitch. Uh, they bought J.J.'s uh, act. Uh, they believed him completely, and they also said the magic word uh, cocaine, which uh, got it clearly established on tape that we were talking about the officers protecting a, a drug uh, operation. From that May meeting, the plan moved quickly. The FBI found a warehouse that met their needs, far from public view and rival drug dealers. JJ and Scabu met Davis and Williams for a walkthrough. JJ and Scabu would meet with Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams at the warehouse for what we call the pre-deal meet. There at that meeting, they would discuss when the dope was coming in, how long it was gonna stay in, in town, and how much money JJ was gonna pay for the officers to guard the dope. Once inside, Davis told JJ that he had half a dozen more officers lined up to guard the cocaine shipments. They would work in 10 hour shifts. Uniformed police outside guarding payloads of cocaine inside. Up to a quarter of a million dollars worth in each load. At that June meeting came the first big payments from JJ. More than $10,000. Everything is going smooth. But one aspect of the warehouse plan bothered Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters. Basically, what we told the agents, unless we had evidence, irrefutable evidence, that these people knew they were guarding cocaine, we couldn't prosecute it. Right. Because the cops stood guard outside the warehouse, they could later claim they didn't know that drugs were inside. I think having some sort of video or Haddon had to find a way to prove Davis's recruits saw the drug shipments. His team mulled over ways to bring the drugs into plain view. The officers would have to be recorded seeing and discussing the shipment. Shipments were delivered to the warehouse one weekend every month according to schedule. Then, in mid-July, the FBI sent a shipment that the guards didn't expect. With one load already in the warehouse, an FBI agent dressed as a courier brought another shipment. The driver shocked the guard cops by unloading the cocaine in plain sight. This was too overt for Len Davis's crew. They didn't want to see drugs at all. They didn't want the vehicles outside the warehouse unloading drugs and stuff where the officers could actually see it. Quickly, get down here. The cops called Sammy Williams on a cell phone JJ had given him. Williams called JJ, and JJ and Scabu raced to the warehouse. J.J. responded like a hot-headed drug dealer. I was arguing with this guy. I mean, we were actually screaming at each other. What, what are you doing? We, you, know, we, you know, where are you? Whatever. And he's observing this. There's a police officer calling Lynn, telling him all what's going on and how this doesn't look good. To the cops, this whole drug operation was starting to look dangerously unprofessional. Concerned, the driver made another call. Sammy Williams arrived to straighten out the problem. JJ explained it was the driver's screw. He asked that the cops escort the van to the city limits right away. Despite the risk, the episode worked. 
It showed that the cops knew what was inside the warehouse. This ain't right. What's going on? To the edge of town, all right? okay. And it was all video. Let them go. Just let them go. Let let go. go. But the episode raised doubts for the cops. Either JJ was an amateur, or he was part of a stink. Either way, they'd be watching him more closely now. Shattered Shield wore on into the summer as all of New Orleans baked. About 100 degrees out there. In August, guarding the warehouse proved hard duty. The cops complained of the wear and tear on their engines from running the air conditioning all day in the heat. They wanted a vehicle that was more comfortable, that could also endure the long hours, perhaps a van. The officers asked Len Davis to provide one, and Davis brought their request to JJ. For the investigation, it was a huge break. The sweaty cops had just handed the FBI a golden opportunity. It was a stroke of luck. One day, Lynn uh, approached me and said that the officers were complaining that uh, they're running their cars in air condition, and the cars are starting to overheat, you know, they're burning gas, you know, on and on and on. Once we were able to rent the van and, and, and put the listening device inside, we were able to hear a lot more conversations. The FBI quickly filed the paperwork to get court-authorized wiretaps for the van. Technicians carefully installed state-of-the-art microphones. They had to yield top sound quality for months with no maintenance. The van was a perfect Trojan horse for getting inside information. I picked this out myself. New, new the shiny new van made the officers suspicious. They wondered if anyone could have tampered with it. It ain't nothing wrong with it. They wanted to know exactly where Davis had gotten the vehicle. I've never seen this vehicle before. Because JJ had so completely won Davis's trust, Davis told the cops that he himself had rented the van. He vouched for it. That calmed their fears. I picked it out myself. What do you think? Len Davis didn't want anyone upsetting his flow of payments. I it the up. FBI would soon learn just how ruthlessly Davis guarded his interests. After three months of shattered shield, more and more New Orleans cops came under the FBI's investigation. Len Davis and undercover agent JJ met often to discuss drug shipments and payoffs for police protection. Davis made frequent threats. They'll tell you, we run this city. We do whatever we want to do. They let me know that very many times. If they feel like they want to shut it down, they'll shut it down. But Davis liked the money. JJ knew that as long as the money flowed, he would never shut the operation down. Davis called the shots for the other officers. He recruited and set the schedules using his cell phone. But he complained about his bill. So JJ offered Davis a new cell phone, free of charge. It was one more way the FBI could record the cops' knowing involvement in drug trafficking. The wires the FBI had planted in the warehouse van were paying off. One night, two guards on the graveyard shift brought prostitutes to the van. The wires picked up everything, even the cops' sexual indiscretions. When Jenkins heard this, she immediately phoned JJ. The situation was a chance to catch the cops off balance. JJ called Davis to complain and to see what they'd get on tape. He told Davis he had checked out the warehouse and found that the cops weren't protecting it. JJ wasn't paying cops to have sex. He ordered Davis to straighten things out. Davis arrived in a fury. His henchmen were threatening to ruin his whole operation. Lynn was upset. Lynn was a businessman through and through. Lynn wanted it to work exactly one way. And he was really upset that I was upset. And uh, he got up, he got up, he came out there and, and just kicked everybody out. 
JJ's call brought Davis down on him hard that night. But the episode triggered deep suspicions among the dirty cops. They now felt sure that JJ was the problem and believed they could run the operation better themselves. They discussed ways to kill JJ. Their plans alarmed Agent Karen Jenkins. When I heard those conversations were they were threatening to do harm to our undercover agent, it sent a chill down my spine. It scared me. Um, before I came to New Orleans, I had worked with JJ in another office, so I knew him personally, and I was very concerned. Despite the threats to his life, JJ was resolute, keeping the cops engaged with plans to further expand the operation. He promised Davis that the largest shipment would arrive before Christmas. After that, he would move the deliveries to another part of the city. All the time, JJ had to draw out more evidence on tape without making Davis suspicious. He was very careful. He watched everything. He paid attention to everything I said. There were conversations where we'd talk, and I'd use the word cocaine. He would count the times I used it. And he would tell me, Jay, you said cocaine five times. Jay, you said kilos five times. So I had to be careful. At the same time, Haddon and his team had to defuse another plot they overheard. The cops were threatening to kill the couriers and steal the cocaine. The agents scrambled delivery times and mapped new routes to and from the warehouse to keep the cops off balance. With so many dirty cops, the FBI couldn't make a clean sweep from the outside alone. Agents would need someone powerful in the police force to be a strong ally. Despite the danger of leaks, they decided to seek help from within the New Orleans Police Department. October 1994 brought fresh changes to New Orleans in a new police chief, Richard Pennington. So, how do you like our first? Pennington was an outsider from Washington, D.C., hired in the hopes of reforming the Crescent City's crooked police force. Actually, why don't you have a, have a seat? The FBI invited the new chief for a meeting. This is not all good. Then Haddon introduced JJ. He informed Pennington that Operation Shattered Shield was uncovering corruption deep in the force that he was about to head. His cooperation would be critical for the success of Operation Shattered Shield. On the streets of New Orleans, Davis and Williams were still on active duty, cruising their territory. Len Davis had a long list of public complaints against him. During their rounds one night that October, Davis and Sammy Williams patrolled the Desire housing project. Seeing the pair of cops approach, two youths took flight. Williams chased one teenager down, bludgeoned him, and left him bleeding in the street. At that moment, Kim Groves, the victim's aunt, decided that police had terrorized their neighborhood long enough. That. The next day, Groves, a 32-year-old mother of three, filed a complaint against Lynn Davis and his partner. She cited the pair for police violence. An officer alerted Davis about the complaint. You want to know his name? Officer Davis, do you know him? Yeah, this is definitely a... Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon saw the report. She reported not only Sammy Williams, who did the actual brutality, but Len Davis as well, who, who had nothing to do with that pistol whipping. And uh, at that point, uh, Len Davis became uh, uh, enraged. For Davis, Grove's complaint came at the worst possible time. It would bring unwanted attention just as the new police chief was coming on board. I know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get her. Len Davis vowed to get revenge. The same day that Kim Groves filed her complaint, Richard Pennington was sworn in as New Orleans' new chief of police. 
That marked the start of Shattered Shield's final phase. The shift from an FBI effort to a partnership with a city desperate to clean house. That very night, Agent Jenkins recorded several conversations that would show just how rotten some of the city's men in blue had become. The first call was cryptic. Hours after Pennington was sworn in, Len Davis made a call on his cell phone. He gave an order to an Look, unknown man. I need you to do a 30 for me. Yeah. The FBI taped the conversation, the but Grove. because Davis spoke in modified police code, yeah. agents didn't know what it meant. While they attempted to decipher it, agents recorded a second, more disturbing call. This time, the unknown man called Davis. As they spoke, a police dispatcher announced a murder in the Desire Housing Project. The victim's name, Kim Groves. When Davis heard the news, he cried, Rockabye. It was the triumphant cry of a killer. When he later heard it, the call shocked Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon. As soon as he confirmed the name of Kim Groves, Davis shut off the radio and then on the, um, uh, the wiretap conversation, uh, over the cell phone just exulted in a primal scream of delight that indeed Kim Groves uh, was dead. When agents reviewed the tapes and checked the phone records, they discovered that the man who spoke to Davis was Paul Hardy. Davis had asked Hardy for a 30, a police code normally used to report a homicide. But that night, Davis used it as an order for the murder of Kim Groves. Kim. Canvassing the projects, agents Kim. quickly learned that Hardy was a known drug dealer who let let's a small go. gang let's of go. thugs. With the help of two accomplices, Hardy acted quickly, coldly, and for just $300. Sped away over a bridge, Hardy threw the barrel of the gun into the canal and handed the body of the gun to an accomplice for safekeeping. What's up, man? When the FBI realized Davis's role in the murder, agents grew more concerned for JJ's safety. J.J. met with Davis soon afterward. He looked carefully for signs that Davis was anxious or upset. Yeah, what's up, he saw man? none. The murder of Kim Groves seemed to have relaxed Davis. J.J. still had to play his part, the role of a drug lord. Though uneasy, he was careful not to talk about the murder. I wanted to ask a lot of questions about it. I couldn't. The only thing I'd ask him was, is there anything different happening since the last time I was here? He said no. And we went on just like nothing ever happened. Is he a cold-blooded killer? I could probably do you in a minute, yeah. Having seen what Davis and his cops could do, J.J. had every reason to believe that he could be next. He was unaware that they were already planning ways to kill him. Days after Len Davis ordered the murder of Kim Groves, the FBI learned of more threats by Davis's men. A New Orleans police officer assisting in Operation Shattered Shield received an anonymous threat. It came with Kim Groves' obituary. The message was clear. Death would come to those who talked. That day, Stan Haddon learned of still more threats against J.J. and the other agents. Agent Jenkins had recorded five cops at the warehouse plotting to kill the couriers and J.J. Then they would steal the cocaine and sell it themselves. Haddon had no choice. The FBI had to wrap up the operation before it was too late. 
Uh, once we realized that uh, the lives of our undercover agents were at serious risk, uh, then we had to react to it. We had to do something. The FBI needed to move up their plans for the big shipment J.J. had promised to Davis. A cocaine shipment so large that it would require a half dozen more cops to guard it. But Haddon needed a location unfamiliar to the cops, a place where the FBI could mobilize quickly. He and his team scouted the Mardi Gras truck stop on Elysian Fields Avenue. The spot had good highway access. It also posed little risk to the public in the event of a shootout. The cocaine would arrive on an 18-wheeler, then be loaded into cars and escorted by the cops out of the city. Every detail had to be mapped out. The plan would require the coordination of 85 agents positioned strategically along the routes. When Davis put out the word about a huge November 18th shipment, he enticed new recruits. As a load of cocaine worth a quarter of a million dollars arrived, Davis, Williams, and their crew stood ready as protection. Agents posing as drivers moved the shipment. From the command center, Haddon and Jenkins kept watch of the whole operation. There were hundreds of ways the truck stop scenario could go wrong. With the undercover agents' lives on the line, there was no margin for error. Cocaine was divided in two loads. Williams escorted one, Davis followed the other. They shepherded the couriers to the edge of town, shielding them from other drug gangs and from the law. To make it easier for our surveillance, we had one of the uh, courier cars go to the east and one go to the west because we had two complete surveillance teams operating simultaneously and we didn't want the two to get crossed up with each other. The operation went off without a hitch. Six additional cops were videotaped in the act of drug trafficking. The FBI was about to enter the last phase of Shattered Shield, arresting the corrupt cops who would kill anyone who opposed them. After the big truck stop operation, FBI agents moved quickly on the murder of Kim Groves. They searched the house of the hitman, Paul Hardy. There, agents found an unauthorized copy of a guide to police codes, the same codes that Davis used when he ordered Groves murder. Another search at the home of one of Hardy's accomplices turned up the murder weapon, a nine millimeter handgun. The two investigations, Shattered Shield and the murder, were closing at the same time. For the ringleaders, the FBI took no chances. Agents came to Len Davis's house the next day when he was off duty. Look, I ain't done that. What are you talking about? Look, I'm a police officer, man. The thug with a badge was arrested on federal drug charges and for the murder of Kim Groves. For Davis's partner, Sammy Williams, agents would use a different approach. Haddon wanted to flip Williams to the prosecution side. At that point? It worked. And they decided, okay, let's uh, throw another curveball and then let's just bring Juan in. So they brought me into the door and I introduced myself, especially to Juan Jackson, the FBI. You could see the, the color leave his face. And his world just came crashing down. Sammy Williams turned government witness. His testimony would later prove crucial for getting convictions. Haddon and his team had no time to lose. Before news of Davis and Williams' arrests could spread, they had to deliver the rest of the gang to justice, dozens of armed men in uniform. The strategy we were to employ was to arrest Lynn Davis on December the 5th. And then uh, on December the 6th, we had all of these officers appear before a federal grand jury. And then on December 7th, 
the grand jury ordered all these officers to come to the FBI office to give handwriting exemplars. Len Davis's recruits arrived at the FBI's office to give handwriting samples for analysis together with 60 fellow officers. Since the drug ring involved no written records and so many officers provided writing samples, the crooked cops suspected nothing. Like the others before it, the FBI's ruse worked. One by one, more than a dozen dirty cops of New Orleans were arrested. That, that was a safe way to do it because obviously all of these officers were armed and they were facing very serious charges and, and that was a way to do it to avoid any potential for uh, any bloodshed or any uh, unwanted uh, uh, resistance by the officers. In court, the FBI's recordings built a solid case against the officers. Are you aware we have hours and the videos and audio tapes spoke louder than the code words and erased all doubts that jurors might have had. Agent Karen Jenkins knew the evidence was strong. The jury was able to hear for themselves what the officers said. They were able to see for themselves what they were doing because of the videos that we had. That wasn't me. It could have been anybody. As Prosecutor Al Winters had predicted early in the investigation, Davis tried to talk his way out of it. All police officers know what that is. It's a homicide. Even after all the safeguards we took, Davis's defense at the trial was that he was conducting his own undercover operation, that uh, it was not really done according to the book, but, you know, he was a, a poor uh, a cop and didn't have a lot of training, but he was trying to conduct his own undercover operation. Davis never admitted any wrongdoing. He didn't need to. The audio and videotapes spoke for themselves. Faced with the prospect of convicting those sworn to protect them, the citizens of the jury listened intently. The tapes were, were chilling. And as those tapes were played, uh, uh, the courtroom was as silent as, as a cathedral. Has the jury reached the verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. Will the defendant please stand? The jury deliberated just 15 minutes. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree and hereby sentence the defendant... Len to Davis was sentenced to death for his role in Kim Grove's murder, which was later commuted to life. In two other trials, Davis and his co-conspirators received 18 convictions for drug trafficking. Fifteen officers were headed for prison. Because he cooperated with prosecutors, Sammy Williams was sentenced to just five years. He would never again wear a badge. You have irrevocably stained that uniform you once wore. But I must reluctantly recognize that other crimes can only be solved with cooperation of people like you. Court dismissed. For the Big Easy, Haddon's case brought a long, hard look in the mirror. You know, I think that the city of New Orleans has been very tolerant of all sorts of, of uh, conduct, uh, which might be considered improper in other parts of the country. It's part of the culture here, and I'm a Louisiana native. Uh, but I think this was a wake-up call to the citizens of New Orleans that there was a serious problem within the NOPD, and that problem had to be addressed. You know, you take an oath, and I think that when you do that, uh, there's no excuse uh, for anything else. I think we helped. I, I think that uh, now their focus is different. I think hiring, I think pay scale, I think everything about what the New Orleans Police Department is about is different. Under Chief Pennington, the New Orleans Police Department revamped its practices and fired more rogue cops. The Big Easy had cleaned house. The department and the FBI continue to work together to bring justice to the city's streets. Thank you. Thank you.